welcome to Hudson Institute. My name is Peter Rao. I'm a senior fellow here working on European issues, and it's my delight to moderate today's discussion on the Azerbaijan-Armenia conflict and the American interest. I'm thrilled to have three great colleagues with me today. Uh, in order of their first speaking, we'll start with Luke Coffey, who is a senior fellow at Hudson. Uh, before joining Hudson relatively recently, he was uh, under the watchful eye of Jim Carafano at the Heritage Foundation for about a decade. Uh, Luke was um, director of the Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies. Before that, he was the Margaret Thatcher Fellow at Heritage. And before joining Heritage, he served in British government and politics, working for uh, then Secretary of Defense Liam Fox as a senior advisor on defense issues and advising uh, the Conservative Party in the House of Commons in Parliament, the Tories, on defense and security issues. A commissioned uh, officer of the United States Army. Luke also served with distinction in Afghanistan and elsewhere. He has written wildly and testified on a variety of topics, everything ranging from the Arctic to Afghanistan. And uh, it's a delight to have him at Hudson Institute. As I mentioned, uh, Jim Carafano already. Dr. Carafano is the uh, vice president of the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy. At Heritage, that's the organization which really oversees all of Heritage's defense and foreign policy work. And he's also the E.W. Richardson Fellow. Last year, uh, Dr. Carafano published Brutal War, a study of the Australian and American experience in Papua New Guinea, 1942, fighting the Japanese. Uh, he too is an army man, uh, having served for 25 years in the U.S. Army and earned a doctorate from Georgetown University. He also edited, I should say, while in the Army, the prestigious journal Joint Force Quarterly. Uh, last but not least is my colleague Mike Duran here at Hudson Institute. He's a senior fellow and also the uh, director of our relatively newly established Center for Middle Eastern Peace and Security. Mike uh, earned his PhD from Princeton University. He's been a professor in a past life and also worked at uh, several think tanks. Mike uh, is an alum of the George W. Bush administration, where he served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and a Senior Director for uh, Middle Eastern Affairs at the National Security Council. So here we are. Um, it's a hot time in uh, the South Caucasus. Anyone who, even on the margins, follows foreign policy will have seen a flurry of activity. The Speaker of the House traveling to Yerevan, the Secretary of the State on the phone with Baku, uh, we're recording this event on Monday, September 19th. Today, both foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan are set to meet at the United Nations under the auspices of uh, the Secretary of State. Uh, we've also seen President Aliyev of Azerbaijan at the SCO meeting in Uzbekistan. Uh, the Armenians have appealed to the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the alliance spearheaded by Moscow, of which Armenia is a part, uh, all in relation to a recent flurry of activity and outbreak of, uh, of conflict as a tentative peace deal, which goes back two years to the latest, to the Second Karabakh War, has frayed. So to put all that into context, to really set the scene and give us a sense of what is happening uh, in the South Caucasus, what is happening between Azerbaijan and Armenia, let's go to Luke Coffey, who just this week, as a columnist for Arab News, devoted his latest column to this topic. Luke, or is yours? Thanks, Peter. And it's great to uh, be back on the same panel with uh, my former boss and colleague, Jim Carafano, and, and be back here with, uh, with Mike. Um, yeah, so what has happened recently is that along the Azerbaijani Armenian state border, fighting has been flaring up. Now, what's different about this situation from previous cases, for the most part, is that this is happening along the state border between the two, not along the line of contact, which was the area where Armenia had occupied inside Azerbaijan and then Azerbaijan proper. Now, not all the time, but most of the time, you, uh, you would see the fighting take place along this line of, line of contact. So that's what really distinguishes this latest round of fighting from previous rounds of fighting. But to really understand how we got to where we are today, we have to you know, go back uh, uh, almost three decades and the collapse of the Soviet Union and the chaos that followed, uh, ethnic Armenians living in Karabakh uh, sought to uh, join, first join Armenia and then create their own independent state. And there was no legal mechanism for them to, to do such a thing. And, and this move wasn't honored by anyone in the international stage, even Armenia itself never recognized the so-called independent republic that 
these ethnic Armenians living in Karabakh actually declared. Uh, fighting broke out when uh, the Armenian military intervened. Um, and in 1993, a very fragile peace, peace, uh, peace deal or ceasefire was agreed which left uh, Armenia in occupation of, of, depending on how you count, around 15 to 17% of Azerbaijan's uh, internationally recognized territory. Now from 93 to about 2018 or so, uh, it was mainly quiet. Some skirmishes along the, the line of contact, but that was pretty much it. In 2018, there was a, a four day skirmish which actually saw Azerbaijan take back some of its territory, just a little bit, not very much. And then things remained calm until July of 2020, when fighting actually occurred along the state border, even though I just said that didn't happen very often. In this case, it did happen in July of 2020. And in fact, uh, the fighting took place in a, in a corridor, an important transit corridor, which I'm sure my colleagues will talk about later, where a lot of oil and gas uh, pipelines travel through. Now, after July, things remained tense until the end of September of 2020 when the second Karabakh war uh, broke out. To this day, nobody knows who shot first in the specific case of fighting uh, in, in September of 2020. Uh, the reality is it doesn't matter because this conflict had been uh, boiling over, uh, so to speak, uh, for almost three decades at this point. And this conflict ended in November of 2020 with a ceasefire agreement brokered by Moscow. And this basically left uh, Azerbaijan victorious, Armenia defeated, and Russia with a foothold, a new foothold in the South Caucasus that it didn't have before in the form of a small peacekeeping mission in the rump uh, area of Karabakh that remained outside the control of the uh, government of Azerbaijan. Now, the reason why I, I led us up to this point is because this peace agreement is crucial in understanding why fighting broke out last week. Uh, there are two important provisions inside this peace agreement uh, that Armenia has still not implemented. One is the removal of all Armenian soldiers from Karabakh. Uh, the, the whole point of the Russian peacekeeping force was that the Russians would be there uh, to, if the ethnic Armenians needed any sort of protection. And the second was opening uh, all communication corridors between Azerbaijan proper and Azerbaijan's enclave called Nakhchivan, which it doesn't have a, uh, a land connection to. So the idea was that in southern Armenia, um, the Azerbaijanis would get access, uh, not control or not sovereignty or not any sort of territorial acquisition, accu um, accusation, but instead just access to transit Armenian territory to link up the two bits of Azerbaijan. And in return, the Azerbaijanis would build a brand new highway uh, that would connect Armenia proper with the ethnic uh, Armenian area of Karabakh, where the Russian peacekeepers are. Now, Azerbaijan has built that highway. It was just completed a, a couple of months ago. Uh, but Armenia still has not granted open access to its territory for Azerbaijan to Nakhchivan. So I, I suspect what has happened in recent weeks is that Azerbaijan is losing its patience. Uh, it lost its patience with the international community over the course of almost three decades uh, when, it came, when it came to Armenia removing its forces from Karabakh. And we saw what happened in the 2020 Karabakh war. And now whether Russia is either unwilling or unable, they have not enforced their own ceasefire agreement. And I think uh, Azerbaijan is um, wanting to raise attention to this very important issue for them. Um, you know, the Azerbaijanis will, will also say that um, it's difficult to have fighting along a state border when, you know, part of that agreement was also the delineation of that border. And there hasn't been any meaningful effort by Armenia to sit down with the Azerbaijanis to delineate the, that international border. So right now it's a very fragile situation that actually reminds me of July of 2020 uh, before we saw the big Karabakh war later on that year. And I think with Russia distracted in Ukraine, we are in uncharted territory now in the South Caucasus. Well, that's a, that's a foreboding, worrying uh, a note to end on. Uh, in March, I was transiting through the Istanbul airport on my way to Ankara and uh, and over Twitter, I learned that you two were transiting through Istanbul on your way to, I think, Azerbaijan at the time. I know Mike was there 
um, during the Second Karabakh War and uh, had some great tweets uh, discovering the country and, and, and coming back really um, giving all sorts of interesting imp impressionistic sort of anecdotal um, uh, insights into, into Azerbaijan and the region. But I believe most recently there was Jim Carafano who traveled there, I want to say over the summer. And so I thought we'd go to you next, Dr. Carafano, to get uh, your read on what you learned on the ground and, and, uh, and what you discovered traveling to Azerbaijan. So um, I'll offer uh, two observations, but really I think the key thing, right, folks should really understand is there's a reason why Luke and Mike and I are doing this. And it's this growing recognition that America must recognize that it has uh, interests in the South Caucasus, that there is, there is opportunity there for the West, for, uh, for, for stability, for prosperity, and it's something that the United States and our, and our European allies should really take seriously. And so delving into the region and, and get beyond kind of what the, what the, the mad tweeters want us to think or, or anybody else, but really understanding the facts on the ground and, and what our interests are and how they can best be served, this is really, really important. So part of our, uh, uh, my trip was we, we went to the, the liberated areas and, uh, and, and I think what's striking about that when you go there is this is a vast swath of territory that looks like the remnants of Carthage. I mean, this was occupied for decades by the Armenians who have you know, sowed nothing really but landmines and unexploded ordinances. Um, they did nothing for this land or for the people of this land. And, and I will credit the Azerbaijanis who not just have a, a a, a claim of sovereignty over this land, but have made a serious commitment with very, very serious money to, to bring this land back to the people. So they've committed a, creating the opportunity for hundreds of thousands of people to return home, clearing millions of landmines and unexploded ordin ordinance. Um, I, I was on the highway that, that Luke mentioned that they, they built for the Armenians. Um, they, they're building airports and they're very serious about bringing this land back to the people, and uh, and I think that that reflects the state of commitment that Azerbaijan has to its people. The other thing I think is is look, um, what did what are the Azerbaijanis trying to do? I mean, you are living in a neighborhood where you know Russia is sitting on top of you, Iran is underneath you. As a matter of fact, you cannot drive to the liberated territories without just kind of waving at the Iranian border as you go by, and 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 on the other side, kind of look across and see the Russian. Uh, peacekeepers, you have Russia on top, Iran on bottom, and and China at your back. Um, so I think the Iranian, I mean, I think Azerbaijanis are looking for 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 two things: is how how do you bring stability in a part of the world that's stuck between between these divergent interests, and how do you bring prosperity to the to the to the Azeris? It, you know, sure they have a lot of oil and gas, and that brings money into the country, but I I think this government has a true vision for its people to bring prosperity and jobs um, to themselves in the region. And, and I think that has significant impl implications in terms of ameliorating conflict in the region, um, in terms of keeping out extremist influences. It's, it's obviously dramatically important for energy um, uh, lines. We've already seen Azerbaijan uh, through the Southern Gas Corridor be, being provided critical natural gas to Western Europe as they're headed into to maybe their toughest winter ever. I think there's enormous potential there. Um, and, and I think the, the, the vision that, I, that, Azur, that the Aziris have for their, the future of their country, um, they're not you know, going to pick fights with Russia, Iran, or, or China, but they recognize that you know, bringing the West to the region and partnering the West is going to bring their prosperity and it's going to help lower the temperature in the region and bring stability. And I think that's something that the West should recognize as in its interest as well. Well, two uh, words or phrases have fallen that lead directly to Mike Duran. One is Iran, and the second is uh, the West has strategic interests in the region. And with that, maybe Mike, you can talk about uh, how you see those strategic interests and, and why this is a part of the world that's relevant for the United States. Well, uh, thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Peter, and uh, thanks, Luke, and and, and Jim for uh, doing this. I agree with every word that that Jim said about the strategic importance of this region. Um, uh, for the for the United States, and uh, I think there are three major issues here 
um, and I'll uh, I'll name the three, but I just focus for this at, th at this moment on one one of them. The, the, the three major interests of the United States here are, are uh, containing Russia, containing Iran, and unlocking the natural resources of, of, of Central Asia. And I'll, I'll actually come back later, Peter, to talk about Iran and, 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 and Russia. Let me just focus for a second on the, on the, on the natural resources, because the Ukraine war has really brought home to us the the importance of energy security for Europe um, and the, the danger of being dependent for of Europe being dependent on uh, on Russian sources. Now, now the Central Asian countries, in particular, uh, Kazakhstan and uh, and Turkmenistan are uh, have enormous deposits of, of oil and gas. But at the moment, those countries are those countries are captive to the Russian and, and Chinese markets, and particularly to the Russian market. So when the Kazakhs, uh, when the Kazakhs uh, export oil to Europe, it has to go through Russia. Russia buys it cheap and sells it high uh, uh, to the Europeans. Um, uh, and through that position, not only makes a lot of money, but it also maintains uh, a dominant position in, 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 uh, in Central Asia. The only alternative those countries have is to turn eastward and go to uh, and go to uh, to China. Turkmenistan has some of the largest gas deposits in in the world, uh, and a simple pipeline from Turkmenistan to Azerbaijan would bring those resources through the southern gas corridor, which goes from Baku uh, through Georgia, through Turkey, through through Greece, and then on uh, through Albania, and then on to Puglia in in, in Italy. Uh, that corridor already exists. If we could plug the uh, Turkmen gas into there, it would have. That's a game changer for the energy security of um, of Europe. Um, Zbigniew Brzezinski, the former uh, national security advisor of uh, of um, uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, wrote a book in the late '90s in which he called Azerbaijan the cork in the bottle of Central Asia, and that's how we. That's from uh, uh, from the point of view of energy energy security that's how we should see that country without azerbaijan if azerbaijan were to fall under russian um, uh, russian domination uh, or if the united states were not to show interest in those uh, central asian uh, resources uh, then uh, then russia will dominate uh, will, will dominate the european markets uh, uh, markets forever um, now now that russia appears to be uh, declining and weak we're going to see a rise of China in Central Asia, and we want to give these the, these countries, that's Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Turkmenistan, and Azerbaijan itself, we want to give them an outlet to the West. And that's why uh, Azerbaijan looms so large in, 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 in my consciousness. P Peter, could I just add a, a short postscript to that? Yeah. Um, and so I think some a lot of us get the energy piece, but on top of that, this is also represents an alternative supply chain. And when diversity of supply chains are increasingly important around the world, um, there's also the potential for a value added supply chain, not just energy, but the other things that the region itself could produce and add value to um, in a supply chain to the West. And, and, and even beyond the energy security issue, if you look West, and you think about the other developments going on in the region. So we have this potential in the Three Seas Initiative to revitalize the infrastructure of Central Europe and build a powerful North-South economic corridor. We have increasing attention to the Black Sea and recognizing the importance of stability and freedom of transit in the Black Sea. And if you connect those two pieces with a middle corridor through Azerbaijan into Central Asia, you have a potential for a new economic uh, uh, you know, it's a Belt and Road that's not owned by the Chinese that I think is potentially stabilizing, potentially is going to bring a lot of wealth and prosperity to people, and, and it's going to bring stability to the parts of the world that's going to make our jobs as Americans easier because we're going to have better, partner, better partners in more stable parts of the world with more capability. So the Middle Corridor and the Black Sea and the three C's initiatives to me are three things that ought to be, we ought to be talking about together 
as really being transformative in the future of, of, of Western Europe. That's great. And maybe, Luke, I can just follow up and stay on the energy piece. How difficult would it be to connect across the Caspian to some of these riches that Mike's describing and that Jim alluded to, to really build a cohesive geopolitical block almost, perhaps it's overstating it, but nonetheless, from Northern Europe all the way down through Central Asia? Well, in practical terms, it's quite easy. Um, if you connected the uh, most Western Turkmen gas field with the most Eastern Azerbaijani gas field in the Caspian, you could create an interconnector of about you know, 45 or 50 nautical miles or so uh, to connect the two fields, which could bring s a, some gas to Azerbaijan. That Azerbaijan at, at this level, Azerbaijan would probably use that gas domestically and then use other sources of gas to increase exports to, um, to Europe. But to realize the full potential of what Mike was talking about, uh, again, building a, you know, a, 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 a pipeline from one end of the Caspian to the other, uh, we're talking you know, about 350 miles uh, under a bit of the Caspian that isn't actually all that deep. Um, this is uh, something that's been done many, many times all over the world, right? So it's not the engineering or technical aspects of this project that limit it from happening, it's the geopolitical. Um, Iran doesn't want uh, Turkmen gas going to uh, Europe but through the Caspian. Russia doesn't want it either. They both say that because of the uh, unique legal status of the Caspian, they should have a say over these pipelines because of environmental concerns, which sounds uh, utterly ridiculous when you look at you know, what, what Russia's been doing with its pipelines all around the world. So the, the, in practical terms, it, it can be done quite easily. Now, the, the question uh, that needs to be answered is, if you can get this breakthrough and you can get this Turkmen gas through a pipe through the Caspian and into the Southern Gas Corridor, at what point um, do you run out of capacity in the Southern Gas Corridor? And this is a big concern. It's my understanding that in the next several years, because of the recent agreement between the European Union and Azerbaijan to get more natural gas through the Southern Gas Corridor, it's probably gonna be at capacity. So we should start thinking about now how we can get um, you know, more infrastructure in place, pipelines laid uh, to get this, uh, potentially get this oil and gas, well, this gas from, from Turkmenistan. I mean, the, the big problem here, uh, m many people say, well, why don't we just put it on a ship and like bring it over? But it's a lot different from oil. Uh, for, for natural gas to make it profitable, if you're gonna liquefy it, uh, to put it on a ship, it has to travel around 2000 kilometers or so for, for you to start making money, for it to be worth it. If you stick in a pipe, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's more cost effective. Uh, so there is a lot of potential there, but the problem is we're not seeing any interest from Europe or the United States on this. I mean, if we had a fraction of the interest that the Clinton administration showed in the 1990s for projects like BTC, the Baku Tbilisi Cheon pipeline, which the US really had no direct dog in that fight. It just knew it would bring better energy security for the region, so it supported it. If we could have a US administration advocate for a Trans-Caspian pipeline in this, with the same amount of enthusiasm, that would go a long way. A US seal of approval would help uh, reassure investors uh, and that, that this project is viable. And ultimately it would help uh, Europe with its uh, energy security. But you know, we have, we the United States, we haven't had a cabinet level secretary visit either Armenia or Azerbaijan since Secretary Clinton in 2012, which seems like ancient history now. Uh, so we're not even on the ground advocating for these things, much less um, in a place to really try to get the ball rolling, unfortunately. Although the Speaker of the House, perhaps not uncoincidentally, visited a few weeks before the midterm elections, but setting that aside. Um, <laughs> That's, uh, that's a whole nother uh, <laughs> uh, panel event, I think we could Maybe I'll Peter, just, um, Peter, can I, can I just, yeah, go ahead, Mike. can I just ju jump in? I just want to repeat something I said a minute ago, because um, uh, I do think, you know, to a lot of, uh, to a lot of ears in, uh, in the State Department, this kind of sounds like pie in the sky. Uh, but as Luke said, it wasn't pie in the sky to Zbigniew Brzezinski. It wasn't pie in the sky to the Clinton administration. A little bit of American elbow grease made this stuff happen. 
Um, and, and we have to understand that we are now in a geostrategic competition with China. And the, 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 the decline of Russia, the decline of Russia means that China is going to be coming in heavy to Central Asia. The United States, these countries aren't asking the United States for any kind of military commitment uh, uh, or even a, even a direct investment from the United States. They just want the United States to help them maintain their autonomy. That's all they want. And we just want to create, we want to help create an economic corridor that will give them prosperity, that will, that will nurture their autonomy. We should be thinking about this as a very important part of the competition with China. And let me, let me collect this to another issue, which is, which is super important, which is climate policy. And you know, the more I look at climate policy, I think I've discovered that climate change is not the great threat to humanity. It's actually climate policy is the great threat, right? Because even now in the midst of an energy crisis, you hear the Europeans you know, scrambling for gas wherever they can find it. And they, and they yes, we need gas as a bridge to the future. And, and they talk about five years. Well, look, the reality is, is nobody is gonna build infrastructure like a pipeline with the notion that you're gonna buy gas from them from five years and then you're gonna walk away. I mean, there, there's not a major infrastructure project in the universe that has a five-year payback. I mean, these are 10, 15, 20, 30 year investments. And the reality is, is that oil and gas are part of the Western energy makeup in the 30 years and beyond. And on the one hand, we have this ideological political commitment to net zero and eliminating gas and oil, which is completely at odds with physics and chemistry and economics and geopolitics. And, and part of what's slowing the train down here is not just the things that Mike talked about, but the notion is, well, we don't really want to embrace this because it can fix with our climate policy. Well, your climate policy is completely unrealistic, and we need to be building oil and gas infrastructure around the world if we're going to have a more stable market uh, and more stable supplies. And, uh, and, and I think part of what's, what's going on here is we have governments who are punishing people who are investing in gas and oil infrastructure, not encouraging them and rewarding them. And that policy is going to have to stop. And, and I think that to me is one of the greatest concerns with our present administration is the, the unwillingness to let go of climate policy at, at the, at the ob, not just domestic production, but the obvious international production that we need to see. And they should be encouraging that, not essentially saying, well, it's OK, you know, buy gas now, but we're just going to stop buying in a couple of years. This is all nonsense. Yeah, and I Pardon me, really... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Peter, to keep, uh, to keep uh, messing up with the order. Can I add one footnote onto what uh, Jim just said? The, the one area where, that I've noticed of late where the U.S. is actually taking an interest in, in fossil fuel development is, the, uh, is in its effort to, uh, uh, to demarcate the maritime border between Israel and Lebanon so that they can develop the gas the gas field that uh, um, in the Mediterranean that uh, that that uh, Lebanon and Israel share this is the, this is such a ridiculous prioritization of the American interest because th what that is going to do is it's going to allow it's going to allow an international consortium to to funnel money into Hezbollah's pockets in in, uh, in in Lebanon. So instead of in, instead of coming up with a project that's going to serve the West and work to the advantage of the United States in the competition with China and Russia, we're we're, we're carrying out a policy that's actually going to help Iran and and, and Russia in um, in uh, in Syria and Lebanon. It's uh, I can't I can't begin to understand uh, uh, how the administration is putting the world together and thinking that this is where Amos Hochstein, the special uh, envoy for energy in the State Department, should be putting his efforts right now. And on top of that, um, in addition to bad policies coming from Washington, the Europeans just, uh, I don't feel like they've woken up yet to this challenge. Yes, they've gone to Azerbaijan to secure the New Deal, but so much more can be done and they, it's gonna require a complete change in uh, mentality in Brussels. Uh, in 2019, the European Union published its Central Asian strategy. It was about 20 pages long. If you open up that PDF document and hit control F and search for the words oil or gas, they're nowhere to be found in this whole document. Uh, but yet there are six or seven mentions of green energy and sustainable energy and all this other stuff 
Uh, and now we're discussing Europeans freezing this winter. Uh, so I, I think, you know, Brussels needs to wake up as well uh, and realize that there is a huge potential in this region if someone just wants to get active. Yeah, um, since, since uh, Russia, Iran, and China have all fallen as, as, as words and actors in this panel, maybe go to each of you um, and, and talk about how they see the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, what their interests are and how, how they want to go about pursuing their interests. Maybe, Luke, you could talk about the diminution of Russian power in the wake of Ukraine and what the implications are. Uh, maybe, Mike, you could touch on Iran, and Jim, perhaps you could touch on China um, to round us out. Yeah, of course. Uh, without a doubt, Russia is distracted, and, and this recent round of fighting comes at a time when most of Russia's national energy is focused on its deteriorating situation in Ukraine. Uh, even in the springtime, in the earlier months of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there was uh, you know, visual evidence of Russian peacekeepers in Karbakh, Russian troops based in Armenia, Russian troops in the occupied regions of Georgia and in Shkinvali region, or also called it South Ossetia and Abkhazia, being pulled out to go fight in Ukraine. Right now, Russian influence is on decline in the region. Uh, the countries in the region know this. It must make a country like Armenia, which is uh, almost wholly dependent in every aspect of day-to-day -day life on Russia, whether it's economics, whether it's security, it must make them nervous. And it must uh, give countries like Azerbaijan who who have to always balance, uh, checks and balance, uh, that's how I would describe their foreign policy against um, you know, countries like Russia, their neighbor Russia in the south or Iran, uh, Russia in the north and their neighbor Iran in the south. It must give them some breathing space to act more independently. And actually what I think we're seeing play out today is the continuation of the process of the Soviet Union collapsing. I don't think it ended in 1991. I think uh, when, when historians look back on this period of time, you know, history has the ability to condense time. I think that the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022 will be seen as a key moment in the collapse of the Soviet Union and perhaps the final act in the collapse of the Soviet Union. But when you see what's happening in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, when you see what's happening with Armenia and Azerbaijan and the Russian invasion and occupation of parts of Georgia, the Russian presence in Moldova, the invasion of Ukraine, we are seeing the continued collapse of the Soviet Union before our eyes. And I think there's a huge question mark on what is going to come out the other side and, and our policymakers need to be ready on this. Iran, how does it see, uh, see Azerbaijan and Armenia? Uh, so Iran is the uh, ally of Armenia. Uh, and Iran, Iran's number one uh, national security threat is the rise of Azerbaijan. Number one, that's greater than the threat from the, uh, uh, from the United States. Uh, the reason for that is about one third, at least uh, between one fifth and, and, and one third of all Iranians are Azerbaijani by ethnicity. And they are all located in the upper, uh, you know, in the northwest uh, quadrant of uh, um, um, of Iran. Uh, the uh, the city of Tabriz uh, in um, in Iran is an ethnically Azerbaijani city. There is a growing um, ethnic awakening among the Azerbaijanis of um, uh, of Iran. We don't have we don't know how strong it is. Um, you know, is it just a cultural awakening? What is the, does it have strong political valence? Will it lead for, um, to demands for autonomy? It's not clear, but it's very clear that the younger Azerbaijanis um, inside Iran, uh, they, they want to, they want to be in touch with their Azerbaijani roots and their, and their Turkey, their Turkish roots. Uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey are, uh, uh, Azerbaijanis are ethnically Turkic. Uh, and their language is close to Turkish, uh, uh, to Turkish Turkish, uh, and, uh, to Anatolian Turkish. That, uh, that is, so they they watch a lot of media uh, from Turkey. And uh, in in Tehran, uh, the leaders of the Islamic Republic are watching this uh, uh, this ethnic um, awakening going on, and it scares them uh, tremendously. And they they see Armenia as an instrument 
for uh, for uh, keeping Azerbaijan on its back heels, keeping it weak, um, uh, keeping it under threat. And they and, and the Iranians don't want there to be this corridor that Luke mentioned from um, Azerbaijan proper to the exclave of Nakhchivan. I mean, so the, 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 this is like um, the uh, Nakhchivan is to is to Azerbaijan what Alaska is to the to uh, to the forty eight states um, uh, 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 below. So the, what the what the Azerbaijanis want is an is a is a transportation and economic corridor across Armenia uh, to Nakhchivan, and they call it the Zangazor corridor. The um, the Turks and the Azerbaijanis call it the Zangazor corridor. The the uh, the Iranians live in fear of the Zangazor corridor because they they fear that it will turn from a transportation. Um, an economic corridor into an actual land grab by Turkey and Azerbaijan, and then and then all along the the northwest um, frontier of um, of Iran, there will be Turkish and Azerbaijani power, and they will then look. And this is the nightmare scenario in Tehran, uh, and the paranoid scenario. And then Turkey and uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan will work to incite um, a movement for independence from the Azerbaijanis of uh, uh, of Iran. Um, it should be a relatively easy. Uh, if 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 we had in Tehran a, a, a um, something other than a terror regime, uh, it should be relatively easy to for the United States uh, to bring together the Russians and the other the um, the other interested parties, and guarantee the sovereignty of uh, of Armenia. Uh, and to offer to Armenia lots of inducements that would improve the economic uh, uh, situation of uh, of uh, uh, of Armenia significantly and help Armenia uh, to uh, uh, to work together with its neighbors for mutual prosperity. Uh, but um, uh, Armenia is not carrying out the ceasefire agreement from 2020, which calls for the creation of the Zangazor corridor. It's not. It's refusing to do that. You never know. Um, you never know in these situations whether the Armenians are not carrying out carrying it out because uh, because they themselves don't want it, or are they being told by their Iranian and Russian uh, uh, partners uh, not to do it? Uh, uh, um, uh, as um, Armenia is an ally of Iran, but it's a satellite of Russia. Uh, Russia owns the security architect, the, the, the entire uh, security system um, in Armenia. It's got three military bases there. It's uh, it controls the border force um, and it can and it has total control. The Russian military has total control of the airspace um, in, in Armenia. So on matters of security, uh, the Armenians have to listen to Moscow. Jim, does that leave any space for the Chinese? Yeah, so before we move on to China, just, just to recap here, when this latest fighting broke out, the Speaker of the House ran to Armenia to provide aid and comfort to the Armenians. Congressman Adam Schiff uh, introduced a, a non-binding resolution to condemn Azerbaijan, and another congressman proposed U.S. military aid to Armenia. So Armenia's closest allies are Russia and Iran. And the first impulse of some of our policymakers is to rush and support Armenia. Now, something's not right here. And like, like Luke said, that can be a whole nother hour. But um, when you look at, when you turn to China and you think of what we call the middle corridor of linking um, Western Europe, definitely Central Europe, a free and open Black Sea across Georgia, Azerbaijan into the stands, um, that would actually, in some ways, benefit the Chinese. That's another supply chain that's available to them. And it'll never be the, the cheapest supply chain, as opposed to just putting stuff on a ship and sailing it there. But when you, when you look at the world in which we live in, and increasingly the ability to diversify supply chains and have alternate supply, that's a value to everybody. And honestly, that would value the Chinese too. But I, I, I think there's a couple of things here. This would not be a supply chain that's owned by the Chinese. The Azeris, for example, are very serious about limiting China investment in their infrastructure because they realize that comes with that. So it would be a belt and road, but it would not be a belt and road owned by China. And, 
and potentially it, it's also a, a, a belt and road that is usable by the South Koreans and the Japanese. Um, and it opens up the stands and the region itself to development. It, even if that cheap energy was available in the region, that's the potential pool for manufacturing, more jobs, more equipment. And, you know, the Aziris, for example, have a very sophisticated maritime uh, building, shipbuilding capability. They build all their own Coast Guard. They build their own ships in the Caspian. They build all their own oil, oil platforms. They have quite an advanced uh, productive workforce. So China could use the Belt and Road, but the point is, it could use the middle corridor, but everybody else could too. And as I think Mike so eloquently said, this is not about people trying to push the Russians and the Chinese out, but recognizing that real independence, real viability is from bringing others in and bringing a, a value added chain to everybody. And you know, I just wanna reemphasize it's something I think all three of us have said is very important. None of us have said we need more American troops. None of us has said we need more American foreign aid. Matter of fact, the Aziris just took less US aid for demining than we offered because they're just paying for it them, themselves and, and doing a better job at it. Um, it's not about foreign assistance. It's not about American military power. It's about American engagement and American diplomatic power uh, because the people in the region will, will do the heavy lifting. And, and again, I want to emphasize, you know, our talk about Azerbaijan is really kind of meaningless if we don't have a stable and secure Georgia, which is the link, uh, and we don't have a free and open Black Sea, and we're not developing uh, Central European infrastructure. And so what do all these things have in common? Well, again, nobody's asking for a big US military presence. Nobody's asking for the US government to pony up a bunch of foreign assistance. But what, what we're looking for is American leadership and engagement, encouraging people to do things which are good for them and are, and are great for us. Is there any evidence, and I guess I'll kick this to any of you who wants to take it, any evidence um, that, um, that the Russians and the Iranians and maybe even the Chinese, but in particular, the Russians and the Iranians coordinate their policy towards uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. You, you mentioned, Mike, that, um, that Iran is, uh, is an ally, Russia is a satellite. And I, I would also add, before I forget, that you have kind of a, a long piece outlining your views in Baku Dialogues uh, um, some time back that I'd urge everyone to read on, uh, on the region. Oh, yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Peter. It's called, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, Azerbaijan in the Struggle for Eurasia, I believe. Baku Dialogues. Luke Coffey has an article in the same... Of course, everyone everyone out there is an avid reader of Baku dialogue, so they don't need to, to they don't even need to hear this. Um, so Anthony Kim has an article in the next issue. <laughs> the uh, Anthony Kim of the Heritage Foundation. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're ganging uh, up on him there. Yeah. So um, uh, th that's a uh, that's a a question for a, a long answer that I don't know that our audience is going to love to hear. So let me just get, just give you the the headlines. Just give me the top seven points in about eleven. The, minutes. the top, the top, the top seven points with a couple of sub points. No, the uh, uh, I don't think they closely coordinate, uh, but they all they all have an interest. They all have a shared interest um, in uh, in seeing to it that this that, that this economic corridor that we are dreaming about uh, doesn't doesn't become bigger. They all have a they all have a, a they all have an interest in blocking Turkey. See this, the, 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 the Turks are becoming more influential in Central Asia because ju just as the Azerbaijanis of Iran are, um, are uh, discovering their Turkic and uh, Azerbaijani roots, so are the, the peoples of Central Asia, the, the Uzbeks and the Kazakhs. Uh, 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 they, are, they are also uh, ethnically Turkic um, and they have all come together in this, uh, uh, in this organization of Turkic states which uh, which really scares Iran, Russia, and China together. And I go into detail uh, in the Baku dialogues on this subject, Peter. So I'll direct everyone uh, um, uh, uh, everyone there. The as for the Russians and the Iranians, they do not have identical interests in the South Caucasus. They both they both support Armenia, but Russia historically has seen the, the, the South Caucasus as its territory. And it wants to be 
uh, Russia wants to be the power that holds the balance between Azerbaijan and Armenia. So it plays both sides. Um, it's closer to Armenia than it is to Azerbaijan, and it uses its the Armenian power to threaten and whack the Azerbaijanis, so to force them to go up to Moscow uh, 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 to seek Moscow's help to solve, you know, to, to manage the uh, to manage the conflict. What the Azerbaijanis have done, so so in that sense, the the Russians don't want the Iranians to take over that role. So there's a, there can at times be a little friction. But the but the Russians and the uh, uh, and the Iranians have a similar interest in building up um, Armenia uh, uh, and in blocking in blocking Turkey especially. The what what happened in 2020 uh, in the ceasefire is that Putin had to acknowledge the Turkish role in the um, uh, in the South Caucasus due to the Azerbaijani Turkish alliance. Um, Azerbaijan is the ally not just of Turkey but also of Israel. Uh, Israel is interested in uh, its relationship with Azerbaijan. It's a vital interest to them, uh, to the Israelis. For all the reasons I said about putting pressure on Iran, it's an important place to put pressure on Iran, uh, but also the Israelis get about, I think, uh, one third of their oil from Azerbaijan, which goes from this, uh, this pipeline that, um, uh, that Luke mentioned, uh, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline, Jehan being a Turkish port on the Mediterranean. Uh, about you know, about every day, there's a uh, uh, in the in, at the height of the season, uh, there's a Israeli oil tanker docked in Jehan, filling up with oil to take it to uh, 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 to take it to Israel. Uh, the um, the 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 Iranians don't like the they don't like the Israeli Turkish role. The Russians don't like the Israeli-Turkish role. They can't do much about the Israelis, uh, but they can try to block the uh, uh, block the Turks. So there's the simple answer to your question is there's a, a lot of overlapping interests. There's a few areas of of friction. Well, um, unless uh, Luke or Jim would like to go no, ahead. No, I was going to say it's, it's you know I just to, in case folks miss this the important point that Mike made. Um, the South Caucasus is one area where Turkish and U.S. interests are are aligned, and where we we should be actually working together. Um, and uh, and and I, I think that would do much to not just improve the U.S.-Turkish relationship, but the success of the, of developing this an independent, prosperous South Caucasus. That that that's going to benefit all of Europe and NATO as well. And just to put a finer point on that, the best way we can bring sovereignty, self governance, security, and stability to the South Caucasus is encouraging all sides to find a lasting peace, to encourage all sides to normalize, uh, to encourage all sides to trade and do business with one another. Uh, because this will ultimately um, squeeze out the nefarious influences of Iran and Russia and even China and bring more stability and prosperity to the region. And this is why, you know, this administration has been AWOL uh, when it comes to uh, bringing peace and stability to this, uh, to this region, and it needs to get more involved. Let, let, let me add to that, if I may, Peter, uh, the, the, you know, Nancy Pelosi and, um, uh, her colleagues who went to to, to Yerevan, uh, they adopted the uh, they adopted the um, uh, Armenian uh, propaganda on the nature of the conflict and including the nature of the outbreak of hostilities. Now, uh, they didn't mention, for example, that um, Armenia is routinely infiltrating Azerbaijan now. Uh, since 2020, to lay landmines, uh, the 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 whole all of these uh, formerly occupied territories um, are uh, um, are uh, bristling with landmines that the Armenians laid. They refuse, they either can't or they refuse to give the maps of where those landmines are. The Azerbaijanis have seen hundreds of people, including very large number of civilians. Uh, killed by landmines and um, uh, uh, and um, booby traps, and they and the as and the Armenians are continuing to lay them. As I said, they've laid thousands since the end of the um, since the end of the since the conflict in 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 
uh, in 2020. Uh, so what the administration's message needs to be to Armenia is stop laying landmines, open up the economic and transportation corridor that you agreed with, agreed to at the, in the ceasefire um, in 2020, demarcate the border so that we can know where the border is between, uh, between uh, um, Azerbaijan and Armenia, and let's develop this region together and everyone can win. In win-win solution. Win-win-win-win. Uh, a, win, a lovely win, note to end uh, on. You know, except for well, Iran, except for Iran, Iran you know, loses. Everybody you know, else can win. Just to add super quickly, you know, the clock is ticking. I mean, Russia is weakened and distracted. Uh, the Iranian deal looks like it has collapsed. Um, the, the the reintegration of Iran in the West is not happening anytime soon. This region is important, and its stability is important. And the time to move is now, not ten years from now. Yeah, and it's not getting enough attention, which is why um, I'm grateful that the three of you took the time to shine a bit of light on a part of the world that is somewhat undiscovered and which our diplomacy is apparently for. Carafano, thanks so much for taking the time today and we'll look forward to seeing all of you again on the next Hudson Institute webinar. Thanks so much. Thank you.